Hello everyone, and welcome to the History of Byzantium, episode 126, Attract and Repel. Last time, we discussed the rise of Romanus Le Capinos, from the pier to the palace, and the end of the wars with Bulgaria, which had done so much damage to the European provinces. As I hinted last episode, the story of Romanus's reign now becomes all about Armenia and the relentless military campaigns in the mountains. But before we embed ourselves with the armed forces, we need to deal with one major domestic issue. According to some reports, the peace deal between Byzantium and Bulgaria that was sealed in 927 came at just the right time. Because that summer, a plague of locusts appeared and swept across the Balkans. Farmers, cursing their luck, settled down for winter, thinking that the worst was over. But they were wrong. It was a white Christmas that year, but the cold did not disappear in January or February, or March. For 120 days, there was frost on the ground. This bitter winter hit the people hard. Humans and animals died from the cold. They died of starvation. Crops wouldn't grow. The price of food went up, and up, and up. At the capital, Romanus had makeshift shelters built to provide some warmth for the poor, and he distributed money to pay for their provisions, but out in the countryside, imperial generosity was in short supply. The next couple of harvests were understandably poor, and worrying reports started to trickle in about how the peasant population of the empire had dealt with the crisis. Facing ruin, and with mouths to feed, many of the empire's independent farmers had given up their freedom. They had sold their land to their richer neighbours. The wealthy magnates had of course survived the crisis better than anyone else. Their diversified estates could provide sustenance even when most of the crops were failing. For a peasant family struggling to survive, pledging their land or their service to a magnate was the obvious solution. And it wasn't just a few families who had been active in the property market. It seems that anyone on a state salary had taken the opportunity to enlarge their portfolios. And that includes clerics and monks. From the government's point of view, this was an alarming development. The power of the magnates was already a threat, as evidenced by the attempts of Constantine Ducas and Leo Phocas to seize the throne. Their dominance of the senior military posts flowed from their wealth and their employment of so many retainers. News that this agricultural crisis had further enriched them led Romanus to act. Soon after the frosts had faded, the emperor issued an edict tightening the rules on property sales. From now on, if an independent farmer wanted to sell their land, then they had to offer it to members of their own class. First to the extended family, then neighbours, then others in the same village, and finally others in the local community. Even if nobody wanted the land, and it was sold to a wealthy man, for ten years the original owner would still have the chance to change their mind and buy it back. This rule was designed to help people who had sold up for the wrong reasons. Temporary poverty was a fact of life, but the government didn't want the magnates gobbling up the whole earth just because of a bad harvest. Another clause stated that if anyone was found to have bought a small holding for less than half of its assessed worth, then it would be returned to the seller with no compensation. Again, the reasoning being 
that such a deal must represent exploitation on the part of the wealthy purchaser. We assume that this edict was written in response to complaints coming in from local magistrates dealing with difficult cases. And it would seem that for the next five years, similar issues continued to be brought before them. Farmers had been exploited at a time of need. Sometimes there had been violent coercion involved. New landlords had caused arguments amongst the remaining villagers. Feelings ran particularly high in the Opsikion, the theme just south of the Sea of Marmara. Provincial troops went into revolt, backed by ruined peasants. Their leader, Basil, was arrested and had his hand cut off. But this may have increased his appeal. He had a bronze replacement fitted and returned to lead them again. After his retroops restored order in 932, Romanus returned to his legislators and they issued another law. Any land purchased illegally since the bad winter was to be returned without compensation. Any land purchased legally since then was to be returned for the original sale price. The wealthy, loosely defined as anyone in the pay of the state, were now forbidden to buy from the free peasants. They could buy from each other or from their relatives, but that's it. There were to be heavy fines for those found guilty of breaking the law. And for land registered with the themes, the time limit for repurchase was extended to 30 years. Other regulations were tightened too. For example, men who became monks could take cash with them, but could not donate land to their new monastic house. Romanus appears deeply concerned that the rich are taking advantage of the poor. On the surface, this might seem like a straightforward case of good paternalistic lawmaking. But what happened in practice? It's not at all clear that the law actually worked. Already, Romanus had had to update his original edict, and these laws would be revised and reissued by three of the next five emperors, which suggests that they weren't having the desired effect. Practically, these laws faced an uphill struggle, because the people who would have to enforce them were the people being targeted by them. In the legislation, the group being banned from buying property are defined as state military and ecclesiastical office holders. And who was responsible for justice out in the themes? State, military and ecclesiastical office holders. So those deciding what was fair in a case of property acquisition would themselves be wealthy landowners, with every reason to want to curry favour with other members of their class. Not all men were corrupt, of course, but the possibilities for the poor to get a bad deal were immense. It's also worth pointing out something I've never found time to talk about before. One of the major issues of not having a police force was that there was nowhere to record the existence of crime. So if you were robbed, what would you do? Nothing, really. There was no government department concerned with random acts of injustice. Well, what about the courts, then? What about the judges and bishops and civil magistrates? Ah, yes, but they were there to settle lawsuits. So if you knew who'd robbed you, you could sue them for theft. But if you didn't know, then you're on your own. So let's say that an illiterate peasant farmer sold his land to a wealthy magnate to feed his family. How will he get justice? Someone is going to have to take up this case on his behalf. He may not even know what the law is. This advocate must work out if the farmer was ripped off, or if he can afford to buy the land back, bring a case against the magnate, and then win the case, or hire someone 
to win it. Again, you can see the obstacles to actually returning a free peasant farmer to his small holding. Beyond the legal, many historians suggest that the whole enterprise was a massive case of closing the stable door after the horse has bolted. We've already discussed the rise of the landed magnates. They've been acquiring territory for a century now, and will continue to do so. In part, this is simply a function of the growing economy. As the population expanded, new land was cultivated, and Arab raids diminished. Everyone was feeling better off, and as in most societies, when the good times roll, wealth inequality grows. The rich have the resources to expand faster than their neighbours. Romanus's legislation did nothing to tackle the causes of poverty, so it was always likely that peasants would go on selling up. And not always unwillingly. Many probably sold for a profit. And because of population pressure, already cultivated land was more valuable. We might think from the tone of the legislation that the government was the good guy and that your average small-holding farmer would hate the magnates who were trying to exploit them. But on the contrary, a lot of evidence suggests the opposite. The magnates were often seen as heroic figures. They were the visible face of resistance to the Arabs. They were the ones who brought back slaves and booty from their raids, not the emperor. For most people, the local magnate was a recognisable figure. It was the outsider, parasitic tax collector, who was the enemy. Basil, the copper-handed rebel, actually pretended to be Constantine Ducas. Even though the general had been dead for nearly 20 years, apparently his popularity as a war hero still resonated, even in a theme a long way from the frontiers. When you look at the wording of the legislation, you get a sense of the perspective of ordinary people. Romanus explains within it why the protection of these small holdings is so important. He starts with the protection of the poor bit, but then goes on to say, The small holding is of great benefit by reason of the payment of state taxes and the duty of military service. This advantage would be completely lost if the number of smallholders were to be diminished. Ah, so the government's real concern is about taxes and recruits. As one historian put it, the edict is less about protecting the poor and more about protecting the state's access to them. As we discussed at the end of the century, magnates were better able to evade taxation. For every peasant who joined his ranks, the government lost someone they could easily extract from. We, looking down from our omniscient podcast perspective, know that the government have a point. If too many people escape their obligations, then the empire may cease to function. But from the farmer's perspective, the local magnate will look him in the eye and promise to protect him, whereas government services seem far more distant and arbitrary. Several historians suspect that pretty quickly, the government knew that the legislation would not function as intended. The static village community it was trying to protect no longer really existed. But the new laws were a vital tool with which to threaten the magnates. If they became overmighty, it would now be relatively easy to prove that they had purchased some land illegally. Confiscation of land, or just the threat of it, might keep them in their regional bases and stop them from expanding too far. During Romanus's reign, we hear of theme judges being sent out from the capital. These new officials would go out to help the Stratihos with his administrative tasks, and of course, be a representative of the emperors in local affairs. The growth of magnate power made those back in the palace anxious about losing control of the provinces Legislation alone could not really temper their activities, but at least it allowed the state a 
pretext for intervening when it was deemed necessary. That was quite a long explanation for some seemingly simple lawmaking, but hopefully you can see the growing tension under the surface between the emperor and his most important employees. And that's the truly complex part of the situation. On the one hand, the government relied on the magnates to keep a large part of the empire running. On the other hand, they feared their power. A solution that many emperors turned to was to appoint new men to senior roles. At least by spreading the wealth, they might play the great families off against one another. So it was with Romanus Lecapinos. Having seen Ducas and Focus fall before him, he chose to appoint a lesser-known officer to be his new domestic, John Corcuas. John will be the man who will lead the Byzantine army for the next two decades and begin the conquest of former Roman territory. Corcuas is a Hellenized version of the Armenian surname Gurgen. The family had risen to prominence during the 9th century in the Armeniacon theme. John's grandfather had served the Emperor Basil as one of the commanders of the Tachmata. John himself won a place amongst the military elite during Zoe's regency and was therefore on hand to kneel before the new emperor Romanus. The two men became friends, their shared Armenian heritage and military upbringing giving them plenty in common. John was just what Romanus was looking for. The emperor needed a new senior general, loyal to him, but he had to be from a leading eastern family to command respect. John ticked both boxes and was made domestic of the Scoli in 922. As you know, Byzantine policy for the past 40 years has been about making alliances in Armenia. Their aim was to isolate and capture the Arab forts in the mountains, thus putting an end to the raids coming from that direction. As you also know, the two main launching pads for raids into Byzantium were Tarsus and Melitene. The Romans knew that Cilicia, where Tarsus is, was more connected to the rest of the caliphate, whereas the Muslim outposts in the mountains were more vulnerable and less likely to receive support. If the Romans could bring Armenia back into the fold, then suddenly a whole front of their endless border wars would be shut down for good. In 926, then, with the Bulgar War winding down, John was given the go-ahead to start pressing forward into the mountains. An order went out in Romanus's name, demanding tribute from the Arab fortresses along the border. The Byzantines were anticipating a rejection of this offer, and when it duly came, the army marched in. The key target was, of course, Melitene. For those who've had a look at the map, you'll see that the city sits on a nice fertile plain, and it's now surrounded by Byzantine themes. John appointed his brother Theophilus to be Stratikos of Chaldea, and also worked closely with Melias, the wily Armenian commander of Lycandus. These combined forces launched an assault on Melitene that summer. They ravaged the plain and then broke into the city. It wasn't called a fortress for nothing, though. The Byzantines made it through the gates, but they could not penetrate the citadel. Melitene's inner sanctum was up high and well guarded. After ten days in the lower part of the city, the Romans left. They took hostages, and the frightened emir agreed, from behind the barricades, to a truce and payments of tribute. According to the Logothetes Chronicle, one year the Romans demanded that Melitene send men to serve in their army. With little choice but to cooperate, Muslim troops duly took part in a campaign and actually sent representatives to Constantinople 
so that the people could gawp at the extraordinary sight of Arabs leading other Arabs as prisoners through the streets. It was a humiliation gleefully reported, but assuming that this is how it happened, it only took place once. Everyone knew that the truce was temporary, but having neutralized the nearest enemy outpost, the Romans spent the next few years bypassing it in order to weaken the emirates beyond. In 927, John gathered a full force and pushed north. The second most valuable target after Melitene was Theodosiopolis, another fortress city which was slowly being surrounded by Roman allies. John raided the countryside, but left the city alone for now. He actually marched straight east to Devin, another Arab city, and this was the same itinerary Heraclius followed all those years ago. Devin held out, despite the Roman use of handheld flamethrowers. Yes, these portable siphons seem to have allowed the Byzantines to shoot Greek fire at the towers of an enemy city, quickly clearing it of defenders. And though this particular mission failed, it made a big impression on Armenians and Arabs alike. John's forces were 500 kilometers from the nearest theme, and yet made it home without issue. There was a little pushback from the Armenians, though. As I discussed at the end of the century, there were many princes and small statelets in the mountains that, as yet, were non-committal about Byzantium. They enjoyed their independence and were no more keen on the Romans dominating the area than they had been with the Caliphate. Even Ashart II, who the Byzantines had put back on his throne, made it clear that he didn't enjoy seeing his friends campaigning so far east. After the bad winter in 928, John was still on the march this time sweeping south of Ashot's kingdom toward Lake Van. Many Arab settlements had grown up on its shores, and there was genuine panic when Korkuas appeared. He captured the town of Kliat, allegedly insisting a cross be placed over the local mosque. Many locals fled, and distress calls were sent to Baghdad. However, no help was forthcoming. The caliphate was rapidly sinking under civil strife. Meanwhile, Melius, the Stratikos of Lycandos, came up with a cunning plan to capture Melitene. He sent a group of soldiers disguised as masons to the city, claiming they'd come to do some repairs. The plot was foiled, but on his way home from Lake Van, John appeared before the city and demanded that they take a Byzantine garrison as part of the truce. This was accepted, but presumably the troops manned only the gates and did not gain access to the citadel. The attack on Lake Van seems to have alerted neighbouring Arab commanders to the danger they faced. The next year, the governor of Azerbaijan blocked John from invading, and the governor of Mesopotamia chased Melius away in 930. But that same summer, John succeeded in capturing Theodosiopolis. In order to achieve this, he had to negotiate with the Bagratuni prince of Tau. Check the map. Uh, this Armenian house were not at all interested in seeing John succeed. They enjoyed having feeble Arab emirates acting as a buffer zone, so John had to hand over captured forts to gain the prince's cooperation, and once the Byzantines were gone, the prince handed them back to the Arabs. Nevertheless, John's main force succeeded in breaking into the city and inducing it to surrender. As at Melitene, a Roman garrison would be installed, though the largely Arab population remained. This was a significant victory, which as long as it lasted, protected the empire from attacks coming into the Armeniacon theme, but it would only hold for the next nine years. The following year, 931, John led another distant raid to the north of Lake Van. 
The Artsruni prince Gagik agreed to campaign with the Byzantines against the governor of Azerbaijan. The Christians emerged victorious again, with two important forts being burnt to the ground. On the way home, John sacked Samosata again. That fort's defences were clearly substandard. In the meantime, though, the people of Melatine had made contact with the Hamdanid family of Mosul in northern Iraq, asking for help. I will introduce them properly soon. What you need to know, though, is that their forces appeared on the Byzantine flank, and Korkuas wisely retreated. As the Iraqi troops continued to follow them, it was decided that the garrison at Melatine was no longer safe. They, too, withdrew back into Anatolia. This show of strength by what remained of the caliphate's forces only strengthened Byzantine resolve to act quickly. Next time, John will lead a huge army to Melatine and refuse to settle for anything less than unconditional surrender. Despite the locusts, the harsh winter, and the bad harvests, despite war with Bulgaria during part of this time, Roman forces continued to campaign in the east every year. This is another reason for the strident legislating to stop magnates from buying up peasant land. Constantinople needed a full treasury each year if it was going to keep offering campaign pay to its soldiers. Doubtless, the domestic could keep some of his men happy with what they took from the Arabs, but cash was still required to fund proper expeditions. Many of the soldiers serving under John's banners were not Romans. There were, of course, a lot of Armenians, but increasingly mercenaries from the Caucasus, the Balkans, and the Steppes were recruited to serve. The cash to pay for them came from Anatolian soldiers offering money in exchange for not serving, a process which was slowly becoming more common. In fact, in 931, when John was attacking the borders of Azerbaijan, the emir of Tarsus raided the Anatolikon. He found no resistance and so decided to attack Amorium. The HQ of the once vital theme made for easy pickings, and the emir rode home with hundreds of prisoners in tow. The majority of local troops were either way over the horizon, serving with John, or had offered to pay someone else to fight for them. It was a sign of things to come. On the next episode, the Romans make the first of their many reconquests, as Melatine is surrounded and starved into submission. As the Byzantines continue to run wild, the Hamdanid family, carving out a kingdom for themselves amidst the collapse of the Caliphate, will be forced to stand against them.